Three months ago, a story began that would dramatically change the fate of the world, and at its center was the humble and not very distinguished at first glance, Dajon. Fate brought her together with Emperor Michael Dinar Altius, a lord whose word was law for the entire empire. The meeting took place in the Hall of the Throne, where every rustle seemed loud and the air was filled with anticipation. Dayan, standing in front of the emperor, felt his piercing gaze on her. The emperor immediately noticed her simplicity and unassuming appearance, which was fundamentally at odds with his expectations of someone destined for fate. Despite her outward ordinariness, the words that followed from the emperor were full of majesty and mystery. Emperor Michael shared with Dayan an ancient prophecy that the doors of Helgornia, a mystical and unfathomable world, were to open to present to the world a child with incredible abilities. This prophecy was not just words. It was part of the history and faith of the people, filled with riddles and predictions. These words had a special meaning to Dayong, as it was the first thing she heard when she was in this world. Her arrival was surrounded by mysticism, for she appeared in the middle of a forest, a place full of ancient secrets and untold beauty. This meeting and conversation with the emperor marked the beginning of Dayon's journey, which may have been the key to unlocking the ancient prophecy and opening the doors of Helgornia. The subsequent developments added intrigue to the already heated atmosphere of the meeting between Dayon and the emperor. Emperor Michael, whose words reeked of power and certainty, shared an unexpected revelation. He mentioned that the mere fact that Dayan had appeared had caused the priest to be genuinely excited, nearing an ecstatic state. This recognition was on one hand a compliment to her, but on the other hand, the emperor's desire to see the death of the priest for his reaction to Daoyang's appearance brought anxiety into her heart. Dayan found herself in a dilemma, for the emperor's words loaded her with a responsibility she did not feel able to bear. The emperor, finding no trace of divine power in her, began to list the abilities that Dao Young was to possess as the chosen one. These skills were many and varied, promising not only strength, but also wisdom to lead the nations. However, when it came time to demonstrate at least one of these gifts, Dayan was unable to answer the challenge. Her failure to display the expected qualities deeply disappointed the emperor, adding a heavy note of frustration to the air. This moment was a turning point not only for Emperor Michael, who began to doubt the truthfulness of the prophecy, but also for Dejan, who felt the weight of expectations and the inevitability of the coming journey, on which she was to either find her destiny or to fail under the weight of unfulfilled hopes. On one of those days when the destinies of nations and states were decided behind the closed doors of opulent halls, something happened in the heart of the empire that became the subject of discussion among all walks of life. The emperor, whose word was law to millions, turned to Dayon, a woman whose reputation and abilities were the subject of much conjecture and speculation. His question was simple and straightforward. Does she possess a skill worthy of note, capable of serving the empire? Dayun's answer, spoken with confidence and lack of hesitation, stunned the audience. She stated that she was physically strong. The nobles present, raised in a tradition of respect for authority and hierarchy, were struck not only by the boldness of her statement, but also by the invisible power that seemed to emanate from her. The emperor, lord of the vast lands, lost his impenetrable mask of majesty for a moment. He was astonished and wondered how it could be that the gods had sent him, a great ruler, such a, in his opinion, useless man. This thought of uselessness once again pierced Dao Young's heart, for this was not the first time she had encountered such an attitude from the inhabitants of this world. A sense of alienation and rejection seemed to accompany her every step of the way. As if wishing to escape the uncomfortable situation, the emperor issued an order that sounded like an exile, though it was veiled under the guise of an order. He ordered Dayon to go to her room, dismissing her from further involvement in the court, perhaps hoping that this would solve the issue that had so suddenly arisen before him. This moment was a turning point not only in the life of Dayon, but also in the history of the empire, although no one present at the time could have imagined the consequences of this decision. After the emperor sent Dayon away to her room, it was as if she disappeared from the court's sight. The life of palace intrigue and lavish events continued, ignoring the loner's absence. Dejan was but a dim memory, her name no longer in conversation, her presence no longer overshadowing the gatherings. 
She had spent all that time in seclusion, immersed in her thoughts and feelings, cut off from the world behind the closed door of her room. But suddenly, everything changed when one day someone decided to visit Dion. Those who came were shocked by what they saw. The room they found was in a horrifying state, as if it hadn't been cleaned in months, if not years. Dust covered every surface, cobwebs hung from the corners, and there was a suffocating smell of mold and oblivion in the air. In the center of this chaos, wrapped in an old blanket, sat Dion, motionless like a statue, deep in thought or despair. When the emperor saw this picture, he was overcome with shock. Never before had he encountered such a desolate and sad sight. The sight of mold disgusted him, and he immediately ordered the room to be ventilated to banish the stuffy air and bring in freshness. Dion, as if reacting instinctively to the sunlight penetrating her secluded space, hid even deeper under the blanket, trying to shelter herself from the outside world. The emperor, who did not tolerate objections, abruptly pulled back the blanket, exposing Dion to everyone present. His decision was tough and uncompromising. All this mess, this garbage, as he put it, must be cleaned up immediately. The order to destroy everything that seemed unnecessary and filthy to him sounded peremptory, reflecting not only his desire to restore order, but also his deep incomprehension and lack of sympathy for Dayan's condition. In the great hall, illuminated by the brilliant light of luxurious chandeliers, an exchange of views worthy of annals took place. The emperor, lord of vast lands and guardian of ancient traditions, noticed the lifestyle of one of his subjects, Dayan, whose behavior clearly deviated from accepted norms. With majestic seriousness, he expressed his fear that this way of life threatened Dayan with an early fate, predicting that she might leave this world in just a couple of days if she didn't change her habits. Thus, he suggested she take up sports as a way to strengthen her body and spirit, taking it as part of his imperial duty to look after the well-being of each of his subjects. However, Dao Young, whose heart was filled with not only beauty but also willpower, decided to do things her own way. Her answer, softly spoken amidst the silence of the hall, was simple. She wanted to be alone with her thoughts, wanting to remove herself from the hustle and bustle and find inner peace. This statement came out of the blue to everyone present, causing shock among the servants who couldn't believe that someone dared to so openly express disrespect for the empire's greatest figure. But the emperor's reaction was unexpected. A smile curved his lips, a sign that he appreciated her honesty and fortitude in his own way. Dion took the smile as a sign of agreement and thought she could avoid further instructions. But the emperor, a great strategist and expert on the human soul, decided to act differently. He gave an order that immediately set the palace in motion. Dion was to be bathed and cleaned up as befitted a lady of her status. It was not only a concern for her physical well-being, but also a symbolic act, a reminder that every member of society is responsible not only for themselves, but also for the order and traditions established over the centuries. The emperor, wise and magnanimous, has shown that in both educating and caring for the health of his subjects, he will find a way to convey his will, even if it requires an unconventional approach. This episode of the story opens a new page of trials for Dayon. In the midst of her despair and powerlessness in the face of the emperor's regulations, she pleaded with Marie, one of the maids who had been entrusted to take care of her. Marie, whose heart was no stranger to sympathy, for a moment almost yielded to these pleas. She hesitated, seeing the true pain and fear in the eyes of Dai Young, whose soul seemed so fragile and unprotected at this moment. But a glance at Dejan, at her haggard and tired appearance, reminded Marie of her duty. Despite all the sympathy she felt for Dayan, Mari realized that it was her duty to follow the emperor's orders, and gathering her strength proceeded to drag her to the bathroom. Dayan, whose feelings were on edge, almost burst into tears with despair and powerlessness in the face of circumstances. It seemed incomprehensible and cruel to her that the emperor demanded such a change from her. Dayan begged for mercy, expressing her deepest desire to be left alone, striving for the one thing she wanted out of life, to just breathe and do nothing, savoring every moment of peace and quiet. In her perception, the emperor's desire to see her healthy and active seemed a disproportionate punishment for her desire for peace and quiet. It was a moment of deep misunderstanding between power and individuality, between duty and desire. 
when Dion's heart was filled with grief and incomprehension as to why her little dream of a simple life without action was being met with such harsh opposition. In the penetrating coolness of the bathroom, where every breath formed small clouds of steam, Dion felt a chill that unpleasantly tickled her skin, reminding her of discomfort, not only physical, but also mental. Mari, noticing the shiver that ran down Dion's thin shoulders, hurriedly added warm water to the tub to warm and pacify her ward. The soft sound of water filling the space was like a soothing melody, dispelling unpleasant thoughts and feelings. Dion, feeling the warmth of the water slowly relaxing her body, suddenly asked a question that had been brewing in her heart for a long time. Did the emperor always remain as unapproachable and harmful as she had seen him? Marie, smiling slightly at the naivety of the question, replied with some thoughtfulness that despite all the difficulties the emperor faced in his daily life, he had extraordinary focus and responsibility. She emphasized that his appearance, every feature of his face and body, expresses inexhaustible ability to work and determination. Dion, thoughtfully absorbing every word, couldn't help but recognize the truth in Marie's words. She remembered how every day, without missing a single one, the emperor took time to practice the sword arts, starting in the early morning hours. His consistency in this began as early as the age of eight, and his skills were said to be far from perfect at first. But through tireless work on himself, daily trials, and labor, he reached the heights of excellence to which even the best knights of the empire could not rise. His name was now surrounded by legends, and his swordsmanship served as an object of admiration and respect among all who had ever come face to face with the emperor. One quiet evening, when the golden rays of sunset enveloped the imperial palace in warm light, Marie, with deep conviction in her voice, expressed the opinion that after Michael's accession to the throne, life in the empire had changed for the better. Her words, filled with sincere faith in a better future, sounded like a hymn to the progress and prosperity which she now believed awaited this great land and its people. At the same time, Dion, standing somewhat to the side, was immersed in thoughts so different from Mari's optimistic remarks. She thought about her own life and how different it was from the emperor's. From her earliest days, Dion felt completely ordinary. She never got the special skills or unique life path that Michael, for example, had. She recalled feeling a burning desire to achieve more in her younger years, striving to escape the shadows of an average life, but each step forward was accompanied by new obstacles, exhausting overwork and stresses that slowly but surely undermined her aspirations and dreams. Life seemed to have become an endless nightmare in which each new day brought no relief, but only added to the already unbearable burden of her existence. Dayan, absorbed in her own thoughts, felt lost among the stories of success and greatness that were so easily and effortlessly shared by others. There was a longing in her heart for understanding and recognition, a desire to find her place in the world where she could feel a part of something great despite her seeming ordinariness. There came a point in Dayun's life when she felt as if she had lost all her vitality and ability to do even the most mundane things. The daily routine that seems to be an integral part of everyone's life has become an overwhelming burden for her. Dion's inner world was so stunned by the weight of existence that she longed for a complete disappearance, an escape from the crushing reality. This deep need to disappear finally found its fulfillment when circumstances transported her to a completely different world, a different reality where she hoped everything would change. However, to her great disappointment, the change of worlds did not bring the expected changes in her life. In this new dimension, Dion encountered the Emperor an encounter that added a new chapter to her story. The emperor, upon noticing Dao Young, immediately expressed his surprise upon seeing that she looked much better compared to her mourning condition. His words were filled not only with noting the outward changes in her condition, but also an indirect reminder of the importance of hygiene and self-care, which may sometimes seem insignificant, but actually plays an important role in everyone's life. The emperor didn't stop there and asked Dayan a question that went deep into her soul, asking why she had stopped eating. This question touched on one of the most painful topics in her life, dealing with the loss of vitality and the desire to continue caring for herself. The imperial meeting in the new dimension was not just another event for Dayan, but a moment when she faced the external reflection of her internal struggles. 
It was a moment when the attention and care shown by someone from the outside, especially someone as powerful as the emperor, could be the impetus for a change in her perception of herself and her place in the world. As the atmosphere in the room grew increasingly tense, the emperor expressed his deep dissatisfaction with the current state of affairs. His words sounded like a stern warning. He made it clear that under no circumstances would he want to find Dayeon's emaciated corpse in his estate. The words sounded not just like a warning, but a show of concern for her well-being, albeit expressed in a stern way. Dayeon, for her part, preferred to remain silent. The thought swirled in her mind that perhaps if she remained silent long enough, the emperor would finally tire of the need to continue her lectures and allow her to leave. Her silence was a kind of defensive reaction, an attempt to escape the unpleasant dialogue. At this moment, Dai Young fell into deep meditation, pretending to be a tree, striving to achieve a state of absolute calmness and detachment from what was happening around her. However, the emperor decided to act in an unexpected way. Instead of continuing to persuade or teach Dai Yan, he took the initiative to declare that the food served in his estate was unworthy of the goddess's messenger. This decision emphasized his deep respect for Dayun and her status, as well as his desire to provide her with the best possible conditions. The emperor ordered the chief cook to be brought in to express his displeasure and perhaps reprimand him for the inadequate quality of the food offered to a guest of such high rank. This turn of events not only emphasized the seriousness of the emperor's intentions to look out for Dao Yang's well-being, but also his willingness to intervene personally to rectify the situation, even if it meant clashing with his own household staff. Suddenly interrupting her silence, Dayan expressed her deep concern for the fate of the head cook. Her words sounded like lightning in the midst of a stormy sky, instilling in everyone present the importance of the moment. She urged that the cook not be punished for the situation, emphasizing that the responsibility for her refusal to eat should not fall on the shoulders of one person. The emperor's reaction to these words was immediate and decisive. He ordered the assembly of all the estate workers, his voice so loud and demanding that he seemed to want to reach every corner of his vast estate. Bring absolutely everyone! His words sounded like an irrefutable order reflecting his intention to identify anyone who might be involved in the problem facing Dao Young. At that moment, Dai Yeon was overcome with a sharp sense of guilt. She realized that her actions had inadvertently caused innocent servants to be punished. Her heart clenched at the thought of the consequences for the servants who were held hostage to a situation that had nothing to do with her. This realization was a heavy burden that Dai Yeon carried, realizing the complexity of what had happened and her role, albeit indirect, in the possible punishments for the servants. This moment emphasized not only the tragedy of the situation, when the innocent may suffer because of misunderstandings, but also the depth of feelings of Dejan, who, despite her own condition, could not remain indifferent to the fate of people around her. Within the heavy air of the room, where every object seemed to hold its breath, a picture worthy of the most tragic and dramatic narratives was forming, the servants, usually silent and inconspicuous, were now like statues, animated with fear and confusion, under the pressure of the emperor's loud, shrill cries, which echoed off the walls filled with history and power. Their gazes were full of apologies, as if every word that came out of the Lord's mouth was a dagger that wounded their hearts. They bowed, apologizing for faults which, in the emperor's opinion, were so significant as to mar the splendor and grandeur of his dominions. In a corner of that room, behind a lush, heavy curtain that barely swayed in the drafts, hid eyes full of fear and regret. They were the eyes of Dayan, a young girl whose presence in this situation was as innocent as it was unfortunate. She shrank behind the curtain, trying to make herself as inconspicuous as possible, while a heavy guilt grew in her heart for the injustice to which the servants were subjected. She understood that all their suffering was the result of a misunderstanding in which she herself was at the center. The desire to disappear, to become invisible, was so great that every breath she took was full of prayers for invisibility. But suddenly the situation took an even more dramatic turn. The emperor, like a thundercloud that had struck with the last stroke of lightning, announced a decision that shocked everyone to the core, the dismissal of all the servants. 
This decision sounded like a verdict that left not only the servants themselves destitute, but also their families, where their children were growing up, hoping for the return of their parents with a piece of bread. Dayun, behind her cloth shelter, heard their desperate objections, where every word was filled with fear for the future of their babies. Those words, filled with bitterness and hopelessness, cut through the air, leaving behind only heaviness and sadness. Thus, in the shadow of the magnificent but at that moment lifeless halls, a story full of fear, regret, and despair unfolded, where each character carried their own cross, whether it was guilt over the situation or hopelessness in the face of losing their livelihood. The moment she took a step towards the majestic emperor, the atmosphere was filled with tension. Boldly, but with a note of nervousness in her voice, she announced that she was ready to eat any dish that was offered to her, as if defying fate itself. The emperor, the embodiment of power and wisdom, couldn't help but smile as he appreciated her determination. A vast buffet spread out in front of Dayon, replete with the most exquisite delicacies, but the stress and excitement enveloped her so much that her appetite vanished as if it never existed. But the moment the emperor's eyes settled on her, a look full of expectation and interest, she realized she had no right to back down. With each bite forcibly sent into her mouth, Dayan hoped that her efforts would not go in vain and the emperor would change his mind about disposing of the servants' fates. Her heart filled with anxiety with every sip, for it was unclear why the emperor had chosen to take her fortitude and determination to the test, playing such a strange and cruel game with her. Suddenly, after Dao Yang showed amazing persistence and willpower by eating more than anyone could expect in her position, the emperor showed a sign of approval. His deep, penetrating gaze softened, and he expressed his admiration for her appetite, taking it as proof not only of her determination, but also of the quality of the food served. At that moment, he decided that the cook responsible for such a splendid treat deserved a special reward. Dayan, realizing her role in this unusual ceremony, couldn't fully understand the emperor's motives, but she felt a mixture of relief and surprise at what was happening. When the butler subtly hinted at an urgent meeting that required the emperor's attention, Dayan felt a surge of relief. She suddenly thought that soon she would be given a break from all the palace intrigue and activities she was so bored with. Watching the emperor rise from his seat, her heart was filled with joy and anticipation of freedom. After all, living on separate estates gave her the chance for moments of carefree idleness that she valued so much. However, with the air in the room still shaking from the butler's last words, the emperor suddenly turned his attention to Marie. With sudden determination, he assigned her the task of keeping an eye on Dayan to make sure she behaved properly and followed the norms of behavior accepted in their circles. Marie, faced with an unexpected errand, was left confused, not fully understanding exactly what was required of her. At that moment, like a thunderclap, the emperor's announcement that he intended to return rang out. These words shattered all of Dayong's dreams of long-awaited solitude and peace. The expectation of freedom and serenity crumbled like a fragile house of cards under the emperor's sudden and inexorable decision. Her hopes of tranquility and being able to enjoy solitude were shattered by the mere promise of his return, leaving behind only a sense of uncertainty and anxiety about the future. In the spacious halls of the imperial palace, filled with silence and grandeur, where every step echoed on the high ceilings, a quiet dialogue unfolded between the butler and the lord of these realms himself. The servant's heart seized with curiosity at the emperor's unaccustomed display of interest in young Dayong, a girl who seemed to have been forgotten for many summers. His words, carrying a soft hint of surprise, slowly cut through the air aiming for the ruler's heart. The emperor, whose gaze was not usually disturbed by the bustle of the courtiers, fell into deep thought for a moment. A memory of a recent discovery surfaced in his thoughts, which caused him to turn his attention back to Dion. Exactly a week ago, rumors had reached him that the girl was refusing food and would not leave the confines of her room, as if she had selflessly taken on some unknown challenge. This news only reinforced his assumptions about her uselessness, giving rise to thoughts that there was no need for any intervention. However, an incident as unexpected as it was poetic made a difference in the course of his reflections. At exactly the same moment that the sun, 
playing with its rays, was creating a mosaic of light and shadow on the ground, the emperor saw Dai Yan. She was alone, secluded under a delicate canopy of blooming lilacs that seemed to shield her from the world. This moment, when time seemed to stop, made him look at the girl in a new way, discovering something in her that had escaped his attention before. Thus, a new spark of interest in Dion was born in the emperor's heart, awakened by that very scene under the lilac tree, where the world around him seemed different, quieter, and more thoughtful, and Dion herself not as useless as she had seemed to him until then. In this idyllic picture, where nature with all its beauty and majesty surrounded them both, the emperor, as if obeying an unknown impulse, took a few steps towards Dion. His approach was quiet, but enough to interrupt her calm. Dion, whose eyes slowly opened like flower petals at dawn, met the ruler's gaze. At that moment, he noticed how carefree and relaxed she was giving herself to this moment under the lilac tree, which seemed excessive to him for a girl of her position. However, when Dayon spoke the words, accusing the emperor of blocking her light, the air between them sparked with surprise and the unabashed audacity of her response. These words, full of courage and candor, struck him to the heart. Despite the seeming brashness of her words, there was something about them that inexplicably caught his attention and made him want to be closer, to understand her world, her thoughts. With this inexplicable anxiety in his heart, the emperor, overcoming his inner resistance and protocols, decided to sit next to Dao Young. In that simple gesture lay a great, unrevealed depth of feelings and questions that suddenly swirled in his soul. He himself could not understand what had caused such an ambiguous reaction, whether it was her unexpected directness, her ability to see the world differently, or simply the beam of light that broke through the tree crown, softly illuminating her face. In any case, this moment was a turning point, opening the door to an uncharted world of mutual understanding and new beginnings. The only thing the emperor replied to the butler, in the language of flowers, lilacs mean memories of youth. Lying in her room, Dayan was overcome with deep regret. Two feelings were struggling in her, the realization of her inaction, and at the same time, a stubborn unwillingness to change. This inner struggle was reflected in her every movement, in every look, filled with silent sorrow. At such moments, time seemed to stop, and the world around her lost its colors, becoming gray and monotonous. Just when Dayong's world seemed most lifeless, Mari's voice rang out like a ray of light that pierced the darkness of her loneliness. The news of the emperor's arrival had a twofold effect on Dion. On the one hand, it was a violation of her seclusion. On the other hand, it caused excitement, a harbinger of change. And when the emperor entered the room, the air was filled with the weight of unspoken words and emotions. From the very first moments of their meeting, the emperor noticed the unchanging sadness on Dion's face, like a shadow that followed her constantly, never letting go or giving her peace. His words may have been meant to comfort or even attempt to break down the walls she had surrounded herself with, but to Dion, they sounded more like a rebuke. Dion, for her part, couldn't hide her irritation. How could a man who had stayed out of her life for so long, absent from her daily routine for three months, now suddenly take on the role of mentor. Her glances and silence were full of reticence, a quiet rebuke for neglect, and at the same time, a thirst for understanding that had gone unanswered for so long. In the last days before the events in question, the emperor had been showing his increased interest in the character named Dao Young to the max. His repeated attempts to inquire about her plans for the future were constantly met with her answers being vague, limited to wanting to just breathe and not think about anything in particular. This caused the emperor not only surprise, but also some irritation. Because from whom, but not from people like Dayan, he expected specificity and clear intentions. One of these mornings, when dawn had barely begun to awaken the world from its night's sleep, the emperor visited Dion again. His attention was drawn to a drawing notebook left in a prominent place. It was a new question. Was Dayan familiar with the written language of their world? Upon learning that Dayong had not been trained in the art of reading and writing, a common skill even for children in his empire, the emperor offered to teach her. The offer of an apprenticeship caused Dayong to become thoughtful, which in turn was welcomed by the emperor with joy. Apparently he interpreted her silence as interest and possible agreement. 
However, despite his hopes and anticipation of a positive response, Dayun declined his offer. This moment was another twist in their relationship, adding a new facet to Dayun's image as a character who follows solely her inner feeling and will, even in the face of imperial attention and care. Observing Dayun's behavior, the emperor could not help but express his surprise, calling her behavior lazy. It was a rare occasion when he had encountered such unwillingness to be active and learn. In response to his comment, Dayon suddenly pointed out that such behavior was not unusual in her homeworld. On the contrary, there were many people there who preferred to behave in such a manner. This admission caused the emperor a wave of anxiety. A picture began to form in his mind of a place populated by lazy and idle people. The emperor, unaware of Dayon's past and the amount of work and effort she had put into her world, jumped to a hasty conclusion about her origins, deciding that she came from a world populated by fools. In an effort to stimulate in Dayon a desire for self-development, the emperor decided to organize lessons for her. He ordered a teacher to be brought to her to awaken her desire for new knowledge. But then his attention turned to another aspect of personal development. The emperor wondered if Dayon had weapon skills. After learning that she was unfamiliar with the art, he offered to train together. This moment was the beginning of a new phase of their relationship. The emperor apparently sought not only to train Dai Yong, but also to involve her in activity, to show her the importance of personal strength and skill. It was a move on his part to strengthen the bond between them, an attempt to find a common interest and space for interaction. At the same time, for Dai Yong, it was a test, a challenge to her perceptions of her own capabilities and abilities to adapt to the new world. When Dayan tried to find out when their first training session would be scheduled, the emperor announced with unfailing dignity that it would begin at five in the morning. This statement struck her as so unusual that she hastened to take it as a joke. However, the emperor, maintaining all seriousness, confirmed that his words were quite sincere and he had no intention of joking. Faced with such unexpected insistence, Dai Young felt that the effort ahead would prove too taxing for her. She made the decision to refuse the offer which certainly caused the emperor to be disappointed. Nevertheless, the emperor did not back down in the face of her refusal. His determination and stubbornness did not allow him to accept the first sign of reluctance from Dai Yong. Instead of backing down, he continued to insist on his own. The next morning, despite his previous refusal, he showed up to wake Dai Yong up and encourage her to participate in the training. This gesture was clear evidence of his firm intention to integrate her into the new reality, to show the importance of discipline, and to bring a new element of activity into her life. This morning's appearance of the emperor at Dayan's bedside was not just a challenge to her previous decision, but also signaled his deep interest in her development and adaptation to his world. On the one hand, it was a test for Dayan, an opportunity to rethink her previous views and limitations. On the other hand, it was a chance for the emperor to prove his interest in her success and well-being, even if it required him to show persistence and patience. When the emperor turned his attention to the tightly closed curtains that hid the morning light from Dai Yian's room, he didn't hesitate to go to the window and resolutely opened them. The rays of the sun, like a golden river, rushed in, filling the space with warmth and light. This gesture was not just an attempt to awaken Dai Yan, but a symbolic action that reminded him of the importance of distinguishing between day and night. The emperor sought to show her that living in harmony with the natural rhythm of the world was the basis for a healthy existence. He emphasized that without an awareness of this boundary between day and night, Dai Yan risked spending her stay in his world in eternal sleep. After the room was filled with light, and Dayan, involuntarily feeling its warmth on her, began to awaken from her unknowing dream. The emperor made one last remark before leaving. He left her a message that breakfast would be served outside, taking advantage of the favorable weather. This choice of eating place was no accident. The emperor sought not only to enrich Dayan's mornings with new sensations, but also to give her the opportunity to enjoy the beauty of the world around her, to smell its scents, to hear its sounds, to immerse herself in its atmosphere. Thus, in leaving, he left her not just an invitation to breakfast, but an offer to start the day with a new perspective on the world around her. It happened at the moment when the emperor was approached by the butler, carrying a letter, the weight of which seemed to change even his gait. The letter contained a demand from the churchman to organize a meeting with Dayon. 
Their concern was concerned with making sure that Dai Yeon, the goddess's messenger, was kept in proper conditions, which was an expression of their deep devotion and faith. The emperor, having unfolded the letter and familiarized himself with its contents, turned to Dai Yeon with the news. His words sounded like thunder, causing Dai Yeon to have mixed feelings of surprise and bewilderment. She, in her modesty and self-esteem, couldn't understand why it was her presence that was causing so much attention. Her own uselessness seemed obvious in her eyes, but the emperor, as if the personification of anger and annoyance, reacted to her words with unexpected sharpness. He reminded Dayon that she was the only revelation of the goddess in the past 32 years, as if trying to wake her up to the realization of her uniqueness and importance. This moment was a reminder to Dayon that her presence in this world holds weighty significance, not only to the emperor, but to an entire religious community. She finds herself at the center of events, where her personality and fate attract the attention of dignitaries and clergy, each of whom sees her as part of a greater picture defined by faith and lore. In a world where tales of divine intervention were not unusual, the appearance of Dayan was a real event. For the temple, it instantly became a source of unprecedented income, like a legendary goose that lays not ordinary, but golden eggs. This phenomenon was so outstanding that even the traditional spectacle that accompanied Dao Young on her way to the palace could not prevent the general delight at her appearance. The emperor, the lord of these lands, was not indifferent to the rumors that reached his ears. He noted before his court and courtiers that the goddess herself had paid attention to Dion, mentioning her healing powers. This statement caused a real surge of interest and an influx of believers to the temples, each of whom dreamed of experiencing the miraculous influence of the newfound heroine. However, deep down, Dai Young had mixed feelings. Contrary to public opinion and the expectations voiced by the emperor himself, she thought about her healing abilities. Even though there was a flurry of activity around her and everyone seemed confident of her divine gift, Dai Young felt uneasy. Her heart was filled with doubts about her own abilities which she felt might not even exist. This internal conflict between the world's expectations and her personal perception of her own abilities presented Dejan with a difficult choice. To continue to support people's belief in miracles or to recognize that her powers might not be so great. Under the heavy oppression of political circumstances, the emperor felt the necessity of taking drastic measures. In his eyes, Dayan had become not only a symbol of hope and healing for the people, but also a pawn in a larger game for power and influence. To that end, he made the decision to take Dion to his estate, a place where the political winds could not reach her so easily. One day, as the shadows began to stretch long on the ground, heralding the coming of evening, the emperor made a request to Dion that sounded more like a plea, not to give in to the entreaties of the priests and stay on his estate. These words, imbued with sincerity and concern, made Dion remember her mother's long-ago admonition. Don't go to adults who promise you candy. Those words echoed in her mind, filling her heart with mixed feelings. Such a comparison, though simple, helped Dion realize the potential danger that lurked behind the gracious smiles and generous promises. However, the emperor's next statement had a cold shower effect on Dayong. With sudden determination, he announced that her sword training would begin the next day. That disappointment cut into her soul like a sharp blade. All her visions of a future where she could benefit people through her dubious healing abilities crumbled under the weight of a reality where the art of war was valued above the gift of healing. Thus, Dayun found herself facing a new challenge that was radically different from what she had been preparing for her entire life. This moment was a turning point in her destiny, forcing her to rethink her place in the world and the role she was to play in the emperor's complex political game. Emperor Mikhail smiled as he looked at Dayan, anticipating the training that would follow. All the servants stood in deep shock, not even realizing what was going on between these two. In a distant and mysterious land, where the fates of peoples and cities were intertwined with majestic history and ancient mysteries, the emperor's project to revitalize the forgotten city of Dayong began to come to life. This ambitious plan, realized through the tireless work and hopes of many, awakened the interest and attention of the distant inhabitants of this mysterious land. A young and idealistic priest named Theora arrived in the heart of the revitalized city of Dayong as a testament to growing influence and renewed hope. 
His visit was not a simple event, but a sign of deep care and attention on the part of the temple. For it was the temple that cared for the welfare and spiritual enlightenment of the people. Theora stepped onto the land of Dan, expecting to be met with wisdom and nobility, but instead found something quite different. From the first words that Theora exchanged with Dayan, it was clear that his arrival had revealed unexpected depths of the human soul. Dayan, the girl whose name was closely tied to the fate of this place, met him with an unexpected confession. Her words, soaked with despair and self-criticism, tore through the silence like lightning splitting the heavens. She confessed that she considered herself useless, not only to the temple that sent Theora, but as a person in general. These words, full of bitterness and frustration, reflected the depth of her inner feelings and struggles. Theora, young and inexperienced in the face of such massive life challenges, was faced with a daunting task. His arrival in Dayong, intended as a mission of support and help, suddenly turned into a journey into the heart of human vulnerability and despair. In that moment, at the crossroads of destinies and feelings, a new chapter of their interaction began, full of unpredictable discoveries and possibilities for both. Inherent in these words that came from Theora was not just an act of support, but a deep understanding of Dion's purpose in this world. He, standing before her, with unyielding faith in his voice, pronounced that her path had been predestined by the goddess herself, which undoubtedly indicated the greatness of her mission, the invisible design that now encompassed them both. Those words, like a light in the darkness, were meant to show Dayan the way through the gloom of her own doubts. The conversation between them continued, and Theora, driven by genuine interest and a desire to understand Dion more deeply, asked a question that made her look at her life in a new way. He asked what she did for a living, what filled her days in this world so full of challenges and mysteries. Unable to admit that her life was full of idleness, Dion replied with uncertainty in her voice that she was trying to master the art of swordsmanship and, with embarrassment in her eyes, added that she was also trying to learn the alphabet of this world. She admitted that the path to knowledge was not an easy one, as they had not yet found the right teacher for the job. Reflecting on her words, Dion couldn't hide a feeling of regret, recognizing that if it weren't for the emperor and his relentless desire to see her grow and develop, she might not have found an occupation at all. This confession revealed to Theora the depth of her inner world, her struggle with her own will and desires. Suddenly, as if his new thought had dawned on him, Theora offered to be the very teacher for Dayon that she had been looking for. He offered to teach her the alphabet and the written language of this world, to be the ray of light that would pave the way for her to new knowledge and discovery. This proposal, unexpected and yet full of goodwill, laid the beginning of their journey of learning and understanding together, on which Dayun could gain not only new knowledge, but also faith in herself, her strength, and her purpose in this mysterious world. After Theora's suggestion of becoming a teacher for Daoyang, doubt flashed in her heart for a moment, echoed in her mind by the emperor's words. He had previously urged her to avoid close association with church officials, fearing perhaps their influence or hidden agendas. However, Absorbed in the moment and the warmth of the support offered, Dayan only said she would think about the offer of training. This moment was a point of reflection for her on what paths and opportunities might open up for her with her new mentor. Theora, as he left the confines of the majestic palace, felt a genuine ecstasy at his encounter with Dion. He was deeply moved by the opportunity to serve as a messenger of the goddess, seeing it not only as an honor but also as a test of his faith and devotion. These feelings filled his heart with joy and anticipation of future days when he would be able to share his knowledge and perhaps contribute to the greater mission that was destined for Dayon. At the same time, the news of Tiora taking on the role of Dao Young's teacher also reached the emperor, causing him to have an unexpected reaction. The emperor was greatly surprised and at the same time annoyed by this development. His concern for Dayun and his desire to control her environment and the influences she encounters led him to see in Theora's actions nothing but cunning and possibly ulterior motives of the churchmen. This thought of the church trying to assert its influence over Dion alarmed him, as every step in her life was part of a grand plan that the emperor was carefully constructing. Thus, a simple offer of tuition assistance became a source of reflection, doubt, and political intrigue in which both church and imperial power were involved. 
and each of the characters in this story faced their own challenges and tasks that promised to bring new twists and turns to an already confusing course of events. In the meantime, Dayon was just sleeping, unaware of the serious intrigue swirling in the background. In that sudden moment when the air in the room was filled with silence and expectation, Dayon felt a wave of surprise wash over her mind. The emperor himself, whose majesty and power had never been questioned, had come to her room again, even before she herself. His interest seemed puzzled, for he wished to know the details of her recent conversation with Theora. Dayon, without giving it much thought or twisting the point, began to put into words the whole context of their short conversation, unaware of the hidden undercurrents of this dialogue. The emperor, clad in the robe of power, listened to her without interrupting. His expression was impenetrable, as if he were weighing each word, giving it a special meaning. The atmosphere in the room became more and more tense as Dion felt the emperor's heavy gaze on her, which made her feel insecure and uncomfortable. She mentioned her future fencing lessons and spoke of her desire to learn the alphabet, which surprised the emperor somewhat. Apparently expecting to hear something completely different, the emperor couldn't hide his excitement. He was proud, catching echoes of his influence in her words. This embarrassment, intermingled with pride, was reflected on his face in an unexpected way. He, a powerful ruler, felt a connection to the simple joys and concerns of Dayan that awakened in him not only embarrassment, but also a sense of deep satisfaction in realizing his own contribution to one person's life. This moment was a revelation to Dayan, for even in the emperor's heart there was room for such simple human emotions as pride and embarrassment. As the conversation progressed, the emperor, immersed in thinking about Dao Young's unexpected progress, told her to continue the story. It amazed him how drastically the girl's life had changed in such a short time. From refusing to eat to striving to learn, her journey has been truly remarkable. But suddenly, his train of thought was interrupted when Dayon informed him of Theora's offer to be her alphabet teacher. This news saddened the emperor a little, for he saw in this event not only the personal initiative of Theora, but also an opportunity for himself to use this situation to his own ends. The emperor, always looking for ways to strengthen his position, saw Theora as a chess piece in a larger game that could help him put in place the churchman whose influence he sought to weaken. Plans were already beginning to form in his head on how to use this situation to his advantage. However, when Dion revealed that it was her own initiative to ask Theora to be her teacher, the emperor was doubly surprised. This turn of events stunned not only the emperor, but all the servants who witnessed the conversation. De Jong's initiative was something unusual, for it was rare that anyone dared to go outside the traditional order, especially in a matter as important as education. Her actions showed her desire for knowledge and self-development, which caused the emperor to have mixed feelings. On the one hand, he saw the potential for realizing his plans, and on the other, he marveled and admired her courage and independence. It was a moment when one man's initiative could change the course of their shared history, presenting new opportunities and challenges for both the emperor and Dayon. The emperor's sudden laughter cut through the air, puzzling everyone present. His hysterical laughter, which appeared on the edge of sanity, made one wonder about his true intentions. The thought flashed through his mind that Dayon may have had an insight into his hidden strategy to use Theora as a puppet in his political games, designed to undermine the power and influence of the temple. The idea seemed to him as absurd as it was ingenious, causing him to laugh uncontrollably. That night, in an attempt to unravel the mysteries of the minds that interested her, Dayun brought up her perplexity to Mari, seeking to understand why it was the choice of her teachers that could elicit such a strong reaction from the emperor. Mari, struck by the depth of Dion's incomprehension, decided to dispel the fog of mystery surrounding their relationship with the temple. She explained that there was a long-standing and very tense relationship between the emperor and the clergy, stemming from deep-rooted contradictions and disagreements. The presence of Theora, a representative of the temple, as a teacher in the imperial household could be taken as a sign of weakness or compromise on the part of the emperor, which was unthinkable for his politics and external image. For Dion, this revelation was an epiphany of sorts, as she had not realized until that moment the entire political game unfolding around her. The realization that her pure-hearted desire to learn and grow under Theora's guidance 
may have inadvertently pulled her into the center of a political struggle for power and influence awakened a new sensation in her. It was a moment when Dijon's personal interests and aspirations suddenly intersected with global political processes, making her part of a larger game, the rules of which she had yet to learn. In a distant and powerful kingdom where the emperor ruled with power and wisdom, a story of unusual learning unfolded. The emperor, whose word was law to all his subjects, gave his blessing for the training of young Dayong. This was no ordinary decision, for Dayon was to become the apprentice of Theor, a man with unique knowledge and skills valuable to the entire empire. The condition that the emperor had set before Dayan was simple, but at the same time required tremendous determination and patience. She had to devote herself to her studies with full dedication and diligence. The emperor, deeply aware of the difficulties that the process of learning carries with it, especially when complex and subtle matters are involved, expressed his willingness to accept slow progress. He did not demand instant results or miracles from his students. He was not concerned with the speed of their success, but with their perseverance and desire to move forward despite all obstacles. It's okay if the process is slow or if the result is not immediate. These words reflected the emperor's wisdom and patience, the realization that great things take time. However, the most important thing for the emperor was the promise from Dayan not to give up, not to retreat in the face of difficulties and trials. This promise was the cornerstone of the entire training process. The emperor believed that strength of mind and unyielding will could overcome any obstacle on the path to knowledge and skill. In his eyes, success was not about accumulating facts or being able to do something right the first time, but about steadfastly striving to move forward, believing in himself and his strength, being willing to learn from his mistakes and not giving up on his goals. This story of Dion's training under Theor and the Emperor's blessing becomes an example not only for the characters in the story, but for all who hear it. A reminder that diligence, patience, and belief in oneself are the keys to reaching any heights. In the depths of the luxurious imperial palace, where every whisper and step echoed in its endless corridors, a quiet dialogue broke out between the butler and the emperor himself. The butler, filled with curiosity and perhaps some concern, approached the emperor with a question that tormented not only him, but many in the palace. He wanted to understand why the emperor had changed his original decision and allowed the priest, Theor, to take on the training of young Dane, especially considering that not so long ago, he was going to restrict the churchman's access to the palace. This question carried with it not just a thirst for knowledge, but an attempt to understand the motives behind the decisions of the most powerful man in the empire. At the same moment, in her private room, drowned in the soft candlelight, Dayan was pondering the same thing. Why had the emperor, whose decisions had always been measured and judicious, changed his previously expressed intention and given his consent to her training under Theor? That question flickered in her mind like a bright star, illuminating the dark corners of her mind where doubts and hopes dwelt. The emperor, meeting the butler's question, opened the veil of his thoughts before him. The answer was simple, but at the same time shone a new light on the situation. It had all been done at Dion's wish. This response was more than just words. It was a reflection of the emperor's deep respect for Dion's personal desires and choices. Despite his greatness and power, he put the will of one man above the generally accepted norms and rules, showing that even in an empire where his every word could become law, there is room for humanity and understanding. It was an act not only of wisdom, but also of trust in Dajan, of faith in her ability to do the right thing. This response hid a profound truth about the nature of power. True power is not about suppression and restriction, but about listening to and respecting the wishes of others. Fatigue enveloped Dayan like heavy, wet clothes clinging to her body after a morning run that had become a true test of endurance and spirit. Thoughts of the inescapable sensation of nausea that gripped her mind only seemed to add gravity to the already unbearable physical exhaustion. After all, this was only the second session in a series of their training, but the challenge seemed endless to her. The emperor, without hiding his disappointment, noted that her achievements, expressed in 10 laps traveled, did not meet expectations. 
His words sounded like a verdict. With these results, she wouldn't be able to hold even a sword. However, unexpectedly, a spark of understanding appeared in Dao Young's eyes, and he softened his tone as if repenting his strictness, promising that she would soon achieve the desired results. Nevertheless, deep within her soul, a sense of despair gripped Dayan. Despite a brief moment of encouragement from the emperor, she wished for nothing more than to give up and be free of this burden that seemed too heavy for her. There was tension in the air as the emperor, with unwavering confidence in his eyes, loudly announced his decision not to let Dayan give up under the weight of circumstances. His words reverberated in the eerie silence like a challenge to fate. Meanwhile, Dayan, devastated and having lost all hope of success, slumped carelessly on the green grass, accepting defeat. Her words, a request to bury her right there in the place of her seeming final despair, sounded like an echo of her inner struggle and frustration with herself. However, the emperor did not accept her surrender as inevitable. He lifted her from the ground with ease, as if summoning her to regain her faith in herself. His words that they still had much to learn sounded not just like a reminder of the long road ahead, but a promise of support every step of the way. The emperor's gaze was unobjectionable. There was an unwavering faith in her potential and future accomplishments. Thus began their journey of learning, the first step of which was the basics of swordsmanship. The emperor personally took on the role of mentor starting with the very basics, simple swings of a wooden sword. This was proving to be a challenge for Dayun. Every movement seemed unnatural and difficult to understand, and her clumsiness only added to her frustration. However, under the watchful eye of the emperor, who would not allow the thought of giving up and saw the hidden potential in her, Dayan had no choice but to try with all the might and perseverance she could muster. This was the beginning of their journey together, a journey of learning, understanding, and growth. Despite his unshakable faith in Dao Yang's potential, the emperor could not hide his surprise when he saw her initial sword skills, which left much to be desired. Seeking an explanation for this discrepancy, he asked Byrne the reason for these disappointing results. Byrne was not shy, stating bluntly that Dion simply did not possess the physical strength required for mastery of the sword. These words deeply affected Dion, making her think about her decision to take part in the training. Her mind began to swirl with thoughts of her own unsuitability and the fact that perhaps she had actually taken the job in vain, believing that success might be unattainable. However, noticing the shadow of doubt and disappointment in her eyes, the emperor felt it necessary to intervene. He decided that words could not convey all that was needed to inspire Dayon, and that the best way to convey the essence of skill to her would be to show it in practice. To that end, he stood in front of her, sword in hand, and began demonstrating basic movements with such grace and precision that each one seemed like art. His movements were smooth and confident, every swing of his sword and every step executed with impeccable precision. The emperor hoped that by seeing these movements, Dao Young would be able to better understand and feel the essence of skill, which was extremely difficult to convey in words. This moment was not only a demonstration of the emperor's skills, but also his attempt to ignite a spark of hope and self-confidence in Dayan. At a moment when Dayan's confidence was on the brink, the emperor shared a thought with her, heartfelt in its simplicity and depth. He expressed the idea that the true value of effort lies in the process of learning and self-improvement, not in the instantaneous attainment of perfection. If everyone achieved success on the first try, then the whole point of training would be lost, he said, emphasizing the importance of perseverance and patience in the journey to mastery. With those words, as a symbol of faith in her potential and an appeal to her indomitable spirit, the emperor handed Dayan a sword. Dayan, inspired by his words and eager to learn more about the personal trials the emperor had endured along the way, stood with sword in hand, hesitating to ask about his personal hardships and frustrations. But before the words formed in her mind, something changed in her perception of her own capabilities. Suddenly, combining the lessons she had just learned from the emperor, she took a swing with her sword that was surprisingly good. That moment was a major turning point for her, proof that even small progress is a step toward greater achievements. This successful swing not only strengthened her belief in herself, but was a vivid reminder that the road to mastery is a journey full of trial and error that ultimately leads to growth and self-discovery. In the heart of the Grand Palace, where the fate of nations intertwined with political intrigue, the emperor, 
who possessed not only power but also insight, expressed sincere words of praise for Dae Yan. His words were not empty compliments, but a sign of respect and recognition. Standing nearby, Byrne, whose mind was bubbling with thoughts, was immersed in contemplating his role in Dayan's development as a teacher. This moment was a point of reflection for him on the influence he had had on her path and development. Later, when the meeting room was filled with the voices of advisors and the rustling of parchments, the emperor turned his attention to the cardinal question of an alliance with the Sarmans. Amidst the clamor of objections and skepticism, he stood firmly on his own like an unshakable beacon. His desire for an alliance was not a whim or caprice. The emperor saw in this step a great opportunity to reject the slave trade, a dark stain on the reputation of the empire, an aspiration for a brighter future where prosperity is not achieved at the expense of the suffering of others. Suddenly, like lightning, the emperor changed the course of the discussion by asking about the progress of financial reform. This question was not a random outburst of thought. It was weighed and full of meaning. The emperor sought to show the temple and the priests that their role and place in the state could be redefined. In his words, one could sense a desire for renewal, a longing for an order where government and clergy work together but not in each other's way. It was a challenge to tradition a call for progress, where every pillar of society finds its place and importance for the good of the empire and its peoples. In the gloomy, foreboding council chamber, where every rustle seemed like the echo of distant storms, one of the ministers, shrouded in the mantle of authority and responsibility, cautiously brought to life a subject that had long been on the heart of everyone present. He expressed general confidence in the public's unshakable faith in Deon, whose purity of soul and steadfastness of spirit was considered an indisputable fact. In his speech, he emphasized that any attempts to put pressure on the church at such a moment could turn against the authorities, because the religious institution enjoyed unquestionable authority among the people. But the emperor, whose majesty and wisdom enveloped him like an invisible mantle, did not share his advisor's fears. With his strategic foresight, he unfolded before the audience a picture of a future where the truth about corruption in the temple would become public. There was no doubt in his eyes that when the extent of the degradation and greed of the clergy reached the ears of the common people, no appeals to faith and trust could drown out the indignation of the people. The emperor emphasized that if Dayan herself, whose personality is the epitome of virtue and righteousness, publicly spoke out against the church, it would be the final nail in the coffin lid of her reputation. However, in the depths of his heart, hidden behind the impenetrable wall of regal calm, the emperor harbored certain doubts. Despite his seeming determination to change the current state of affairs, he did not act hastily toward Dayeon. There was a certain ambivalence in his words. On the one hand, the desire to use her image to achieve his goals— on the other hand, the realization that Dayon was not a mere tool in his hands. He realized that Dayon's power over people's hearts and her unwavering faith and ideals made her a figure too significant to risk her reputation recklessly. In this high-stakes game, where every decision could change the course of history, the emperor faced difficult choices, weighing the pros and cons before taking the next step on this thorny path of power and truth. The majestic emperor, preparing for the big moment, intended to visit Dion to personally present her with a token of recognition and gratitude for her tireless work and efforts. This gesture was to emphasize the importance of her efforts in the eyes of the top leadership and the entire empire. Dai Young, that she had never been noted for her loyalty and tenacity in his eyes, displayed exceptional abilities worthy of such attention. However, when the fourth day of training came, to everyone's surprise, Dayan did not show up for class. This absence caused a wave of concern and questions, as it was unusual for her to miss scheduled activities without a good reason. The emperor, concerned about her absence, contacted Byrne, one of her closest associates, hoping to find out what had happened. He received a reply from Byrne that Dayan had decided to take a day of rest, which was rare for such a dedicated individual. Determined to see for himself how well Dayan was doing, and at the same time present her with a gift, the emperor went to her palace. His footsteps led him to Dayan's private quarters, where he found her resting in her bed. This moment brought out another side of Dayan's life, 
reminding us of the importance of balancing labor and rest, even for those who dedicate themselves to serving the empire. This meeting was not planned, but represented an important moment of understanding and mutual respect between the emperor and one of his most valued subjects. In the grand hall where every step echoed between the tall columns, the emperor, with a displeased expression on his face, began to express his displeasure at Dion for her seeming weakness and quick surrender. However, his stern gaze suddenly softened when he noticed the state of her hands. He had heard rumors of her diligence and incredible dedication to her studies up to this point, but it was only now that he could see how deep her efforts were. Those battered, bruised hands were a testament to her hard work and perseverance. With amazement in his voice, the emperor turned to Dayan, asking why she had never shared the hardships of her training with him, why she kept everything to herself. Whereupon, without waiting for a reply, he ordered bandages to be brought immediately to relieve her suffering. At that moment, Da Young was overcome with mixed feelings. She expected the emperor to be angry at her weakness, because in their world, strength and determination were the highest virtues. Nevertheless, a completely different emperor appeared before her eyes, full of sympathy and understanding that spoke of his deep respect for personal sacrifice and effort. After the bandages were brought in, the emperor looked at Dao Young with a new look of respect. He not only recognized her efforts, but openly praised her for her indomitable will and perseverance in the face of hardship. Dayan, who until that moment had seemed to think that the emperor was taking pleasure in her predicament, suddenly detected in his words a sincere recognition of her labor. It was so unexpected that she could not refrain from saying thank you to him. Her gratitude touched the emperor's heart, causing him to tremble and feel an unexpected sense of warmth. Seeing her sincere reaction and realizing the depth of her suffering and effort, the emperor felt the need to take responsibility for her well-being. He stated that he would assign someone to take care of her wounds on a regular basis, making sure she received the best care. Then, suddenly, as if wanting to add lightness to the long, tense atmosphere, the emperor suggested that Da Young take a walk. This suggestion was so unexpected that it instantly changed the tone of their interaction. From that moment on, a new bond of mutual respect and understanding was established between them. The gesture offered not only physical relief for Dayan, but emotional support as well, emphasizing that the emperor saw her not only as a subject, but as a person deserving of respect and care. That evening, as the golden rays of sunset glided softly down the walls of the majestic palace, the emperor found that the tea he was drinking seemed incredibly fragrant and delicious, more so than ever. This moment of tranquility was suddenly broken by a question from the butler, who inquired curiously, and somewhat cautiously, as to the reason why the emperor so often put Dayeon in his place, which caused bewilderment among the courtiers. The emperor, slightly surprised by this revelation, had no time to reply before a knight entered the hall bearing important news. The message concerned a priest named Theor, who, as it turned out, actually went by the name Theo. He was 25 years old and came from a commoner background, with no noble origins or special magical abilities, making his figure rather unremarkable within the confines of the sacred temple. Little was known about Theo, and this mystery surrounding his background and past seemed suspicious to the emperor. Perceiving this information as something that needed further attention, the emperor did not hesitate to order further investigation to find out more about Theo. His decision reflected a deep prudence and an unyielding desire to protect his state from possible threats lurking behind the mask of ordinariness. This instant reaction to a seemingly trifling matter revealed the deep strategic mind of an emperor always ready to act for the good of his people and the stability of his domains. The great emperor, ruler of many lands and peoples, was deep in thought for a moment. He faced a question as heavy as the weight of history on his shoulders. In its grand hall, filled with gold and light, a priest named Theo appeared. This man dared to set foot on the sacred thresholds of the palace, hiding behind a mask of innocent mission as transparent as the thin cobweb of morning dew in the rays of the rising sun. The emperor could not but recognize that such a daring visitation required not only courage, but also cunning. In his greatness and wisdom lay the dilemma. Should the priest be punished for his insolence in disturbing the order and tranquility of his domain, 
or should he be rewarded for his unbending courage and perseverance 